give you an opportunity to turn to Galatians chapter two, if you haven't already. And we're going to read just a few verses from there. So uh, let us pray and move forward. Our heavenly father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you're doing, Lord. We ask you to move by your spirit in our hearts and in our lives. We ask you, Lord, to lead us and guide us by the Holy Spirit, Lord. And we pray that if there be any on the other end of my voice, Lord, who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to them by the Holy Spirit. You would challenge them, Lord, to come to know you as a personal Lord and personal Savior. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word with your people. Now we pray that you continue to bless as we move forward. Give us ears to hear as well as hearts to receive what you have for us today, Lord Jesus. And we'll thank you for it. In your name, we say amen and amen. All right, Galatians chapter two. Galatians chapter two, I'll begin reading in verse one. And I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Again, my preferred version, but you may have a different one, which is okay. Galatians chapter two, verse one. Then 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, verse two, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that the gospel, the good news, which I preach or proclaim among the Gentiles but privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So now, and I'll fill out all the other details in. Let's go to verse nine. So this is the apostle Paul writing, and he's writing to the churches in Galatia. We know that to be true. There was multiple churches from chapter one, <clears throat> verse two. He's writing to the churches in that particular region of Galatia. So let me just kind of give you a brief ge uh, geography and a lesson here. So Galatia was in the area known as Asia Minor, which you and I today, we know as Turkey. So you have, and, and if you have a map, I would say, look at this because it gives you a better picture of what they're referring to in the Bible. So on the on the sea coast of the Aegean Sea, you had Ephesus, and then you have Greece on this side. So you have Ephesus here and you have Greece, and this is Asia Minor, what we know as Turkey today. You have Istanbul up north, and then as you're moving east, you had Galatia, Bithynia, as you're moving up towards Russia. So Northeast, Bithynia, which we read about that in Acts chapter 16, um, Galatia, Cappadocia, and then it moves down and there's key cities there named um, Antioch, Tarsus. And as you're moving down, you're moving down into the, what we know as the Palestine or the, not Far East, but Middle East. Middle East. So here's the East, Asia. And then as you move East and as you move South and Southeast, it, it's considered Asia, uh, excuse me, the Middle East. And as you move towards even modern day, as you move towards China and uh, say Vietnam, Thailand, that's considered the Far East. That's why they call it the Far East. So in this particular region of Galatia, huge region, there were many churches 
and Paul was writing to these many churches in this area, right? So that's, and that lets, we know that to be true, uh, just geographically, as well as the scriptures in the Bible that Paul is sharing with us. So many churches in this area, not just one, multiple churches with many believers. So again, verse one and two, and then I'll jump to nine just to reiterate. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation. So it wasn't his will. It was, he was being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed to him. So he was led by revelation. And as a result, he communicated unto them that gospel, the good news of Christ, which I preach among the Gentiles. So he let them know, I've been preaching amongst the Gentile nations, the Gentile people in Galatia, in Bithynia, in all these other areas, Cappadocia. But privately to them, which are of reputation, referring to the Jewish uh, Jewish believers, lest by any means I should run and had run in vain. So he covered both, preached to the Gentiles, but he didn't exclude the Jewish believers in Christ in that region as well. So verse nine, so he gives us the, the foundation of the conversation that he's having with the brethren in Jerusalem after 14 years. Now let me give you a little background. So at this point, Paul had been in the ministry, he had been saved and been in the ministry 17 years. How do we know that to be true? Because in Galatians chapter 1, verse 18, after he was converted, and this is a little bit of Bible study here. So after he was converted in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, he was in Damascus for three days. And after Damascus, he went to Arabia. That's where we pick it up here in Galatia. So he went to Arabia for three years, and the Bible tells us that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. So he said he was three years, after three years and eight in Arabia, he went up to Jerusalem. Excuse me. He went up to see Peter in Jerusalem, and he stayed with him, abode with him 15 days. So he finishes out that chapter, and now in chapter 2, he says, now, 14 years later, so again, three years plus 14 years, 17 years. So his first trip to Jerusalem as a man who was saved, living for Christ, it had been his second trip to Jerusalem. The first trip was three years. The second trip was a total of 17 years. Why is that important? It's very important. It's critical to have that timeline because there should have been a lot of growth in 17 years. We know that the church, even in its early stages, 17 years is not that old, but there was a lot of growth. There should have been a lot of uh, <clears throat> development, spiritual development in Jesus Christ. So 14 years after, again, he went up to Jerusalem. Now verse nine. So now we have the early churches established and there are leaders in that church. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was uh, the leader of that church. And again, a little bit of Bible study. We read here in Galatians chapter 2, what is happening in Acts chapter 15, the first church council. So the first church council, 17 years after, well, first church council recorded, after the apostle Paul was saved. They probably had others, but this one was recorded in Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> so here in verse 9, this is parallel with Acts chapter 15, 17 years after the conversion and Paul had been in the ministry. Okay. Verse 9, and when James, Cephas, which is Peter, and John, those same three, that uh, not the same three, but those three, well, they'll explain, who seem to be pillars, again, leaders, pillars, in the church, they perceived or they understood that the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me Barnabas and the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, which they had already been, they considered the Gentile 
people, Gentile nations, heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So basically what that's saying is <clears throat> the church leaders, James, Peter, and John, they gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, the okay, the blessings um, to go out and reach, continue to reach the Gentile nations. Hence, fulfilling what the Bible says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So not just the Jewish people, but the, the world population. Also fulfilling the great commission of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, where he says what? Go ye into all the world, preach and teach, baptizing the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then also he followed that up in Acts chapter one, verse eight. He says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, starting in Jerusalem, in Judea, the countryside, the country, in Samaria, the Northern region in Palestine, and to the uttermost parts of the world, Asia Minor, Galatia, Bithynia, Greece, Turkey, all these things. So this is how we see the Bible coming into fruition, the gospel being spread throughout the then known world as we know it today. So again, 17 years later, he, re, he makes a second trip to Jerusalem. They gave him the right hand of fellowship and they said, okay, you continue to go and preach, proclaim the good news to the heathen and we are going to continue to speak to the, the Jewish believers, the circumcision. So again, I gave you the reference Acts chapter 15 because circumcision was a, a, a issue that they were discussing and arriving at a conclusion or having a resolution concerning the physical circumcision versus not being physically circumcised. So verse 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor. And I'll explain that. The same which I also was forward to do. Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch. So Antioch was a major city there in the region of Galatia. If you have a map, you can look at it. So the disciples, Peter, the church leaders, even though they were in Jerusalem reaching the Jews, they still went into other regions because there were Jews in other regions, Jewish believers, excuse me, in other regions. So they made their rounds and they reached out to them as well. So here in verse 11, we read how that Peter was come to Antioch and Paul says, I withstood him or I opposed him to face, face to face. It wasn't gossip, it wasn't through third party. He confronted him, he opposed him, he withstood him face to face. He called him out because he was to blame. So something had occurred. This is what occurred, verse 12. For before that certain came from James, so I, I just share with you, they would travel from Jerusalem and they would go minister to Jews in the other regions. So the Bible says here, for before that certain came from James, representatives of James, the head of the church at the time, the leader of the church at the time, Peter, he did eat with the Gentiles. So Peter was reaching out to the Gentiles as well. So that was before certain representatives from the church in Jerusalem came up to him. He was fellowshipping with the Gentiles. He was eating with the Gentiles breaking bread with the Gentiles, but now let's see what happens. But when they were come, the Jews from Jerusalem, when they had come, he, Peter, withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Verse 13, and the other Jews disassembled or played the hypocrite role, <laughs> played the hypocrite as well. That's what disassemble mean. And the other Jews played the hypocrite or disassemble likewise, 
with him in so much that Barnabas also was carried away, moved with their dissimulation or their hypocrisy. So I want to stop right there and go ahead and share with you all uh, what God has laid upon my heart. So I want to speak to you about the ministry or ministerial unity challenge. Now, I know I've shared a, a number of things with you, and we've been talking about unity over the last four or five weeks as the Lord has laid up on my heart. And I want to continue that thought and look at it from a different aspect as far as ministerial. Jesus made this statement in the Bible. In Matthew chapter five, and I'll share it with you again, Matthew chapter five, verse 13, I'll read it. He says, ye are the salt. We are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? So if the salt has lost its effect, its power to preserve, then what impact does it have? Wherewith is it salted? What's the purpose? Or he goes on, he says, it is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. So as salt has a purpose, which is to preserve, you apply salt to food and it preserves it, it extends the life of it. He made that parallel and he says, we, the Christian believers, we are the salt of the earth. We are here, God has placed us here. We are here today to do what? To provide and to share the hope of, of preservation in Christ, of being our, our souls being preserved as a result of Jesus Christ living in us. So Jesus says, if the salt has lost its savior, if it's lost its state, if it has lost its impact, then it's not considered salt. So how does I how does all that come together? We are the salt of the earth. God has us here, I believe, as a preserver to share with family members, to share with friends the preservation, good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I shared with you earlier how that we all are a part and have the ministry of reconciliation or restoration. He said it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, 20. He ended that by saying, we are ambassadors. All of us are ambassadors. All of us, as we have been reconciled, he's transferred that restoration, that reconciliation and placed it in our laps as we have been reconciled, as we have been restored, we are to lead men and women to be reconciled with Jesus as well, to be restored in Jesus, as well as to follow up and share the good news with them, the doctrine of Christ, the word of God, that they may be preserved. Hence, that's why we are the salt of the earth, right? So, in this ministry of Jesus Christ that we are continuing. I hear people say, I have this ministry, I have this ministry, I have this. All these ministries that people say that they have, it should be the ministry of continuance. It's continuing the ministry that Jesus started, the service that Jesus already started. We're simply continuing it, not changing it, not adding to it, not uh, making it something different. It's the service, it's the ministry of reconciliation to restore men and women back in favor with God. So in this ministry that we all have, there must be unity. There must be unity. As we read throughout the book of Acts, unity, unity, 
unity. The, the church in Acts chapter two started off in unity, continues in unity. It must do the same today. The ministry, the service in Christ, the continuing service, continuing ministry of Christ, of reconciliation must be saturated with the unity of each participating believer, right? So with that being said, ministerial unity, the ministerial, I'm referring to the ministry of reconciliation, whether you're a preacher, whether you are uh, have the ministry of hospitality, um, whether you have the ministry of bereavement, whatever it is, it must be in unity, all working together in the unit, the body of Jesus Christ. And this ministerial unity is challenged, brothers and sisters. It is challenged in our present day where ministers of the gospel are competing one with another. I know more scripture than you. I know more scripture than you. I have a larger church than you. I have more following than you. All these different things causes the unity of the ministry of reconciliation to be challenged. And it is not of God. But nevertheless, as individuals, people, imperfect, even though in Christ, imperfect, we bring about these challenges. I shared all that, and I'm going to give you, I read to you the Bible account where we see an instance of ministerial unity being challenged. I read to you, I gave you some background on this, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 15, here in Galatians chapter 2, and I just share with you, and I'll reiterate, briefly summarize, how that the Apostle Paul, who, who once, as Saul, his name was Saul, his birth name was Saul, he persecuted the church, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, you can read about his life in Philippians chapter 3, uh, the epistle to the church in Philippi, Philippians chapter 3, he goes into detail about his life, how he persecuted the church, also in Acts chapter 9, as well as Acts chapter, I believe it's 26, 27, he tells King Agrippa and Festus uh, about his life before the conversion. Well, now he's been converted, Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus. And he gives us a little bit more detail of what transpired after Acts chapter 9 there in Damascus and here in Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 2, how that God called him and led him in the wilderness, if you please, like the Holy Spirit led Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. The Holy Spirit led the Apostle Paul into Arabia, and he was there for three years, being trained by God, being taught by God, being humbled by God, being prepared by God to do what? To reach out to the Gentile people, to reach out to the Gentile nation, hence fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus, go ye into all the world, all right? So he shares that with us in Galatians chapter one, again, uh, verse 18, 16, 17, 18, and then going into Galatians chapter two. So he's in the ministry. And the Bible tells us, Paul tells us that after those three years of being in Arabia, Galatians chapter one, verse 18, that he went to Jerusalem. And he went there to present himself, himself to the church there to the leaders of the church, because think about it, all the disciples of Christ, they considered him a foe. They considered him an enemy of the church because he persecuted the church. He was going to Damascus to incarcerate, to detain those in the way or those believers in this man, Jesus Christ uh, from Nazareth. So, the church, the born again believers, the disciples of Christ viewed him as a threat. So hence, 
after being in Arabia for three years, he goes to Jerusalem to present himself to the church leaders, getting the okay of the church leaders. They're spreading the word to all the other believers that Saul the persecutor and is now Paul called by God, soon to be an apostle of God. So that was the first reason, first purpose, he went to Jerusalem as we read in Galatians chapter one, verse 18, after a three year period. So he went to Jerusalem, presented himself to the, to the church, to the brethren, um, got that squared away, that part of it. And he was there for 15 days. So a little over two weeks in our time, our calendar. And then he proceeded forward. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter one, Verse 21, he says, afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Sicilia. And verse 22, and was known by face, unknown by face unto the churches in Judea, which were in Christ. Verse 23, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed, and they glorified God. So, now he's in the region of Syria, as well as Sicilia. And he's preaching there for a number of years, hence Galatians chapter two, it tells us, gives us the timeline that he had been there for 14 years. So 14 years in the ministry, preaching to the Gentiles, uh, establishing churches um, and mentoring disciples, and helping them to grow in Christ. So now Galatians chapter two, he's in the ministry. It's been a total of 17 years. Again, Galatians chapter two, verse one, he says now after 14 years of being in that region, so a total of 17 years in the ministry of Jesus Christ, in the service of Jesus Christ, he returns to Jerusalem and he took Barnabas and Titus with him. And he went there and he started telling them, I, I've come to you by revelation to let you know I've been preaching in Asia. Souls have been converted. Churches are being established. Um, God is making a difference in Galatia, in Sicilia, in uh, Cappadocia, in Syria, in all these different places. God is making a difference amongst the Jewish, the heathen nations. So he's in Jerusalem after 17 years of being in ministry. And now in verse nine, the Bible says, and when James, Cephas, which is Peter and John, who had seemed to be pillars of the church or pillars of the church, and the Bible lets us know what a, a pillar is, the dictionary also lets us know what a pillar is. A pillar is a person or a thing regarded as re as reliably providing essential support for something. So James, Peter, and John, they were reliable. They were apostles. They were leaders in, in the church under Jesus Christ. So they were the pastors at that time, the leaders, the, the overseers, et cetera, et cetera. So Paul presented himself and these three men not limited to them, but the Bible lists these three men, they gave him the right hand of fellowship. Basically, the hey, okay, the blessings, you know what, you're doing a good work, go back and continue to reach more Gentiles, continue to move westward into Colossus, into Ephesus, into Smyrna, to all those areas. Keep moving west across the Aegean Sea and go into Greece and in Greece, there in Corinth and go to Macedonia, Thessalonica, on and on. So hence, this is how we got all these uh, books of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul, because he was the missionary to the Gentiles in the ministry, all right? So the, the three church leaders, James, Peter, and John, the pillars in the church, they perceived, they understood, they were convinced. As a result, they gave him the right hand, the fellowship, the blessings, 
let the word be known to all the Jewish believer, believers in those regions. This man, Paul, he is an apostle of God. We've given him the right hand of fellowship. The ministry is united, right? The ministry is united. God is moving. Things are happening. People are being saved. There's power in unification. Things get done in unification. As the acronym goes, team, together, everyone accomplishes more. We see that happening in the church. We see that happening amongst the believers. It's not just the Jews being saved, but the Gentiles are being saved. Gentile churches are being established. Um, all these wonderful things are happening. Um, Matthew 28, 19 and 20 is being fulfilled. Acts chapter one, verse eight is being fulfilled. Joel chapter two, verse 28 is being fulfilled. God is for, pouring his spirit out upon all flesh. All these wonderful things are happening as a result of ministerial unity. As a result of the ministry of reconcile, those who are executing the ministry of reconciliation in a united fashion, with the united vision, with the united on a united front to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. No one is being excluded. All right. Verse 10, notice the command or the nugget they placed in them. So go reach the Gentiles. Only remember the poor. Remember the Jews that are in Jerusalem. What are they referring to? It's the Jewish believers in Jer Jerusalem who are under persecution under persecution by the Roman emperor of, uh, by the name of Nero. And as a result of persecution, it wasn't just physical persecution, which led to death, but they were also being persecuted uh, by which they were, they were unemployed. They weren't given opportunities to, to gain employment in various things. So there was opposition, persecution. So hence the church leaders, James, Peter, and John told Paul, don't forget the poor, which in Jerusalem. And we read Paul writing to the church in Corinth and instructing them to send money to the saints in Jerusalem. And that's the reason for that, because they were being opposed, they were being persecuted, and the brethren, the Gentiles who were being saved, they were being asked to support those who were being persecuted in Jerusalem. So it said, remember the poor, and Paul says he was eager to do that. So now, again, unity, unity. All these things are happening. The blessing, God is moving. Churches are being built. Souls are being saved. The gospel is spreading throughout Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Um, all these things, wonderful things are happening. And then Peter. Peter leaves Jerusalem and goes up to Antioch. And again, geographically, as you look at a map there, Antioch was a major city in Galatia in that region. It may have shared a couple of regions, Galatia and Cappadocia. But the Bible tells us that in, in the book of Acts, that they were first called Christians in Antioch. So we know that there was a great following of Christ in Antioch. Jewish believers, as well as Gentile believers, because they were first called Christians in Antioch. So here in verse 11, Peter went up to Antioch. As I shared with you, they would leave Jerusalem and they would travel through the various regions, uh, mentoring, fellowshipping with, encouraging um, believers, the Jews to the Jews, and Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles. So Peter went up to Antioch, and Paul says, I withstood him face to face. So here we find the ministerial unity that was flourishing, and souls were impacted in a positive way. Families were being saved. Now we have this shift here in verse 11. Paul saying, I had to withstand Peter in Antioch because he was to blame. Blame for what? What had transpired, as the Bible goes on to tell us, 
Paul said he had to withstand him. So now all the blessings that was coming as a result of a unified effort, now they were stunted. Now they were challenged because of instances and decisions being made from those who are in the ministry. Lives were being impacted in a negative way because of decisions being made by those in the service for God in the ministry. So Paul, being the man of God he was after serving God all those years, continuing to serve God all those years, he said, I withstood him. I brought it up to him face to face. What had transpired? Peter had gone to Antioch and no doubt saw the movement of God, saw all these wonderful things happening. And he started hanging out with the Gentile believers and this was okay. This was a blessing. Fellowshipping with the Gentile believers, breaking bread with the Gentile believers, uh, teaching and pouring into the Gentile believers, having a good time in the Lord with the Gentile believers. But the Bible goes on and tells us, then some of the Jewish believers who came from James, sent by James from Jerusalem, when they came up to Antioch, all of a sudden Peter left. Peter left the Gentile believers. The issue was these Gentile believers hadn't been physically circumcised. And that was an issue amongst the Jews. So they held on to some of their culture. And Peter was okay with it until the peer pressure came. The Bible tells us he stopped fellowshipping with the Gentile believers. He stopped breaking bread with the Gentile believers, fearing Fearing what? What the Jewish believers would say. Fearing those who were of the circumcision. Fearing that they would come and say, why are you fellowshipping with those, those individuals? They're not circumcised. They have to be circumcised. They, in order to be a part of the church and in order to be a part of the family of God. So Peter broke off his fellowship with them. And hence, this disturbed Paul, disturbed the Lord, and hence, Paul withstood Peter, confronted Peter on this. The point I'm making in all this is because of cultural compromise, and that's exactly what it was. It was a cultural thing amongst the Jews to be circumcised, and because of this cultural compromise that Peter had, it had a negative impact on the Gentiles. He withdrew from them. He broke fellowship with them because of what he thought others would say. Brothers and sisters, we experienced that in our own lives. We experienced that, well, you know, my family came into town. I'm not going to say nothing about Jesus because they like doing this and like doing that. Will we compromise the good news? Will we compromise, sacrifice the good news, the gospel of Jesus because of fearing a family member, fearing a coworker, fearing a supervisor? What we have, they need to hear. This goodness, this hope, this assurance that we acquired and obtained and have living within us, other men and women need to hear it, regardless of the traditions that we grew up with, regardless of the customs that we grew up with, regardless of the cultures that we grew up with. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Peter, after all these years, I gave you the timeline. Paul had now been saved and in the ministry at least 17 years. 
So Peter, much longer than that, so he should have known better. He walked with Christ, been with Christ, blessed by Christ, full of the Holy Spirit, and yet we find Peter compromising. Compromising the salvation and the upbuilding up and edification of souls because of what someone else may say, what someone else may think. Let that not be our testimony, brothers and sisters, because the unity of the ministry will be challenged. It will be challenged if that is the case in our lives. So here we have in the Bible setting, the ministry, the unity, the togetherness, the oneness, the same goal, the same vision, the same mission, continuing the ministry of Christ, it was now challenged because of culture, tradition, feelings, emotions, what this one may say, what that one may say. God's been too good to us, brothers and sisters. God's been too faithful to us. God's been too loving. God's been too kind. God has been sufficient to us in our lives. Let us not allow anything in this life, be it a family member, or not that the family member has done anything wrong, but let us not step down in our minds, if you please. There's another word I'm thinking seat down or step down or tra traverse down because of what they we think they may think because of fear because it will challenge the unity of the ministry that God has given you the ministry of reconciliation the service of reconciliation we all have it well, I believe that every Christian is a minister in their household providing a service, whatever that service is, be it compassion, care, comfort, hospitality, whatever it is, it all works together to draw men and women to Jesus Christ. It all works together to get our loved ones who do not know Christ to fall in love with this Jesus that we have. It all works together. So we are all ministers in some capacity within the body of Christ, because we all have called been do, to do a service for the Lord Jesus. And we don't want that ministry, the unity of that ministry, us helping one another, the, the togetherness where there's power to be challenged because of cultural, traditional things or fear of those cultural, fear of those traditional things that come into play. Here in this Bible reading, Galatians chapter two, again, accompanied with Acts chapter 15, it was challenged. It was challenged to the degree that the believers who were not circumcised, Titus, Timothy, and numerous others, just to name a few, it could have challenged them to stop living for God or stop being a part of the fellowship. Let not our lives have that testimony that any compromise to culture, to traditions, to fear of what someone else thinks or say become a challenge to where it hinders someone from coming to Christ. So Peter, what happened here where Paul had to oppose him and Paul had to withstand him. Peter showed favoritism, discrimination, and separatism. Favoritism, discrimination, separatism because of fear. Fear of possibly losing the status within the Jewish culture, losing uh, status, losing position, what they would say, that fear brought about favoritism, 
discrimination, separatism. He had been serving God many, many years. What's the point of this? The point in this is that we must constantly work on ourselves, brothers and sisters, because a lot of times decisions that we make or things that we do or not do is a result of situations, it's situational. And as a way, as a result of the situation, either positive circumstances can birth from it or negative circumstances can birth from it. Let us make sure and let us be prayerful that positive circumstances will result as a result of our consecration, dedication, commitment to Christ, regardless of who's in our presence. So the ministerial unity was challenged maybe for because as a result of just a non-thinking moment from Peter, separating himself. Think about that. Put yourself, let us put ourselves in the position of those Gentiles, Gentile believers in Antioch. They're fellowshipping with the man of God. He's come all the way from Jerusalem. He's pouring into them the goodness of the gospel. He's sharing with them stories of, of, of what it was like walking with Jesus, Jesus being here, uh, here on earth. And these individuals, they're living for God. They're serving God. As Peter wrote later, he says, what? He says, because ye have not seen him in the epistle of Peter, yet believing you rejoice with hope and unbelievable, I'm mixing it up. So you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There you go. You rejoice because you have not seen him and yet you're serving him. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So can you imagine they're rejoicing, these Gentile believers. Peter is pouring into them. He's telling them what it was like. He's telling them firsthand witness of the miracles that Jesus did. Uh, Lazarus uh, resurrecting and, and the lame man walking and the blind man able to see. And Peter is just pouring into them. Can you imagine how excited those uh, Gentile believers were? How excited they were that he took the time to come all the way from Jerusalem being a Jew and pour into these Gentile believers and encourage them and edify them. So being lifted up and being inspired and being motivated to work for God, to live for God, to serve God, to tell their family members about God, all these different things. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's some Jews coming up. Peter withdraws from them. He withdraws from them. So they go from a high to a very, very low. A high being lifted up, being talked about Jesus to a very, very low. I can't be around you. That could be a huge stumbling block. Let not our lives do that. Let not our lives reflect that because it will definitely cause the unity of the ministry to be challenged, to be challenged. So Paul opposed him. Paul dealt with this and he had to. And notice the impact of Peter, verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled or they also played the hypocrite likewise with him. So Peter's decision to do that impacted those other Jews and they said they, they did the same. Hey, hey, you guys can't come in here because you're not circumcised. So the decisions that we make, right or wrong, has an impact on others, has an impact on others. So the Jews, they also played, the other Jews, they played hypocrite likewise with Peter so much that Barnabas was carried away. He was moved by their hypocrisy, moved. And as I've already just kind of shared with you, they're fellowshipping and all of a sudden there's a detachment. There's a detachment. This is that, hopefully I say this right, the cause and effect and or the influence and the impact. 
Peter could have influenced them, was influencing them on the positive, lifting them up, having a positive impact, a great impact. But just that, that decision to push away from them because of these other individuals that flipped it totally and caused confusion. Hence, the unity, the togetherness was challenged. And without the intervention of God, the Holy Spirit using Paul, it possibly could have caused a permanent division. And we wouldn't have the book of Galatians. We wouldn't have a lot of these other books that Paul was writing because of a division. But thanks be unto God. There was a man. God had a representative. God had an ambassador who was willing to confront another ambassador and say, that was wrong. That wasn't right. You got to make that right. The impact that that's going to have on the Gentile believers, second-class citizens, second-class Christians. Again, they were first called Christians in Antioch. And I believe if the timeline is right, I have to check it, but I'll make this statement, but I'll check it. It was after this instance that they were called Christians in Antioch. So we, we, we know that as a result of the confrontation, or excuse me, of all withstanding Peter, evidently things were made right and God continue to receive the glory, souls continue to get saved, and they were first called Christians here in Antioch. So I believe it was after this situation, and it was rectified, that they went on to be called Christians in Antioch. As I wrap it up here, I just want you to think, just really just sharing this account with you. Just look at your life, look at our lives, not in a negative sense, but have my actions, my words, more so my actions, has my actions caused unity, be it in my marriage unit, family unit, on the job, whatever, has my actions caused unity to be challenged? See, brothers and sisters, and I share this with others as the Lord leads me, it's not about quoting a lot of scriptures. It's not, wearing, it's not about wearing a suit of clothes. It's not about having a title. It's not about a certain education level one has attained. Again, Peter had been living for God a long time, serving Jesus a long time. He was a leader in the church. It let us know it. It's not about all these positions. They can be used in a positive sense to promote the gospel of Jesus and to draw people in but it's also really about personal examination. As Paul wrote later, he says, I don't wanna do anything to bring harm to the ministry, to bring fault to the ministry. Not that we're perfect, not that we make all the right decisions in life, we do not, but we can slow it down, we can stop, we can consider, we can ask for the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit where it seems like fear is beginning to overtake us or things are beginning to happen and you start feeling anxiety. Oh God, slow down my thoughts, Lord. Help me to cast down those thoughts and those imaginations that's trying to exalt themselves against the knowledge of Christ that I have. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse four, verse five. Help me to cast those things down because souls are at stake. My child is at stake. My child's soul, my, my, my sibling's soul is at stake. My friend, my neighbor's soul is at stake. Help me, Lord, help us to consider and to make wiser decisions, better decisions, Lord, thoughtful decisions that our actions may reflect our thoughtful thoughtfulness. The ministerial unity 
was challenged. This, this is one instance. There's other instances as well. Brothers and sisters, as we live for God, as we serve God, we have the Holy Spirit here to help us. Help us navigate life. Help us navigate domestic life. Help us navigate our personal lives. And we can do all things through Christ. He's given us the strength. He's given us the power. We will trip. We will fall. We will stumble at times, but we'll get back up. As Paul lays it out there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Yes, we fall, but we're not cast down. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. We get back up. We learn from our failures and we do better in them because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So yes, ministerial unity is challenged at times. Family unity is challenged at times. Marriage uni is, unity is challenged at times. Relationship unity is challenged at times. But because greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world, we'll overcome. There'll be a positive that comes out of the challenges. Believe that in your heart. Believe that in your mind and pursue that in your life. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'll be with you until the end of the world. For those who do not know Christ as a personal savior and you've gone to church, you've gone to Sunday school, week after week, month after month, year after year, maybe years, decades at this point, but you have yet to really receive Christ as your personal savior. You're not really unified with the body of Christ. I'm not talking about a particular church congregation, although within the congregation, those who are living for God, you will be united with them. But you, you, you've gone, you've experienced the social aspect of going to church. But you haven't united with Christ. I pray this is an opportunity for you to just unite your life with Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a simple, simple equation with, this, with a positive result. And that's found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 concerning being unified with Christ. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead in the resurrection of Christ and you will be saved. And the Holy Spirit, once you're saved, he'll begin to work all the other things out of your life and make you look like Jesus. You won't have to worry about hypocrisy in the church. You don't have to worry about hypocrisy in that congregation, hypocrisy in this congregation, hypocrisy in mom, hypocrisy in dad, hypocrisy in brother, hypocrisy in sister and nephew, in, in hypocrisy and minister this one, minister that one. No, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, that God raised your savior, Jesus, from the dead, and you be saved, you be united, you walk with Jesus, you live in harmony with Jesus, you allow Jesus to work out all those other things in your life. It's like credit card debt, right? We get credit card debt or debt in general, and uh, we don't have the resources, the financial resources to pay it all off. As long as you make payments towards it, you're in good standing, just like our lives. We get saved, you get saved, you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you accept him, you ask for forgiveness of any known sins in your life. The debt has been paid. Romans chapter one, I am a debtor unto God. The debt has been paid through Jesus, but our lives, just like that credit card, 
we don't have personally as individuals, we don't have all the resources to make our lives perfect, but we live for God. We serve God who is resourceful to work out those imperfections in our lives and make us look more and more like Jesus. And looking more and more like Jesus, brothers and sisters, this is my opinion based on what I know about the Bible. It's, it deals with unity. As Jesus prayed, as I close here in John 17, he said, Father, I pray that they would be one even as we are one. I know they're imperfect. I know they're a work in progress, but as long as they allow the Holy Spirit to work in them, to keep them in good standing with me, he'll continue to work things out of them. But he can work it out because they're linked up, they're connected, they're in harmony with me. Get your life in that position. We can, we shall, we will do all things because Christ give you and me the strength. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord, for being so good to us, being so faithful to us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes to the word of God. And I know that this title is, is, is a little unorthodox, ministerial unity challenge. But as we read your word, Lord, and we incorporate your word in our lives, we can see that we are ministers of this gospel of reconciliation. And we are empowered through spiritual unity and, and unity one with another. And we also see that it, it's challenged at times because of people, ourselves as well as others. So it does get challenged. There are challenges. But God, you've empowered us and we thank you for this to work through the challenges. And it's working through the challenges, Lord Jesus, you make us stronger. And not only do you make us stronger, but you give us wisdom to be able to share that with others. So we thank you, we praise you, and I pray you bless my brothers and you bless my sisters and you, and you keep your hand Keep your hand upon their lives, upon their families, upon their households, for we need you, Lord. And we appreciate and we're grateful, Lord. We enter into your gates daily with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise because of what you've done and because of who you are and because of what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. We give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. Continue to bless, Lord, continue to strengthen us, continue to teach us, and we'll give you the glory in your name, Christ. We do say amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen.